know exactly what's going on. <laughs> uh, Janet alluded to it earlier, and I mentioned this in our prayer time here before the service. I said uh, that it feels like to me that um, I, I, I am standing in the gate at a horse race, um, and there are all these thoroughbreds, people in our church who have gifts and talents and passions, and, and I'm uh, on one of those horses, and, and it's like the gate has thrown open, and we're all ready to go, and some of you are running ahead, and others of you are getting ready to run, and um, not that there's one winner in this race, but it just kind of feels like God has thrown open the gate, and there's so much energy moving forward at Discovery Church, and I just want you to, if you're, if you're not feeling that, or you're not uh, you're not feeling that. I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, well, yeah, I, I hope you're all feeling it because uh, I can't walk around here at all and not feel that going on. So um, anyway, so I thought I would share that with you. I think that that's just been a wonderful thing that's been happening over the last little while. Uh, another personal matter before I get into the, the message of the sermon um, I've been really convicted by God to invite six people into a prayer group, and uh, I'm only going to ask for six, and it, it, it's, it's, so this is going to be like um, intimidating prayer group, okay? Um, so I'm going to be asking those six people who want to join me in this to come before God and this group of people to confess our sins to one another to be prayed over, laid hands on each other, and to pray for God's spirit to be poured out. I surrender. This song just really spoke to me again about doing that. And if you're interested in being a part of that, this is probably pretty intimidating for many of you, uh, but if you're interested in taking that step and saying, God, I need a group of people that I can say what's on my heart, that I can talk to about my failings, and that they will pray for me. This is not praying for other people. This is not praying for the world. This is not praying. This is about each one of us praying for the other and saying, God, do something in this person's life and in their heart. And if that's something that you're interested in, I would uh, love to hear from you. So I um, was not planning on saying that this morning. It was just, just kind of struck me when we were singing that song. So I've been thinking about it for a while, but I wasn't planning on saying anything. Anyway, uh, the message today, we are entering into a new series called From the Rugged Cross to the Empty Tomb, and it's our Easter theme series. Uh, now, I could have chosen, I don't know, any one of 20 or 25 stories in the journey from that week when uh, Jesus shows up in Jerusalem and gets ready for what happens on the cross and the empty tomb. There's just so much going on that I could have spent half a year preaching on it. Uh, of course, I can't do that, so we've kind of selected a few passages on this journey, and the first one is, is when Jesus starts to tell his disciples that he's leaving. Hey, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going on to another place, uh, and they're like, where, where, wait a minute, uh, three years of this conversation, this discipleship that we've had with you, this mentoring that we've received from you, it's coming to an end, and they're coming to recognize that this is the, the space that they're at. And so they ask, start asking all kinds of questions. And Jesus says in this passage probably one of the most controversial things that he has ever said. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, those first three statements would have been controversial enough, but he follows it up with a clarification. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's probably the hardest thing that your friends who are not Christians have about Christianity. That this God of yours excludes people. It seems that way from the text. But I want to take a few minutes and help you look at it, hopefully, from the correct perspective. Because when we do that, we don't see that at all. We see something very different. Before I get going on that, uh, how many of you are, are Star Wars geeks? Come on. Come on. It's time to fess up. All right? Star Wars geeks in the room. Uh, the rest of you who have watched Star Wars and maybe even enjoy The Mandalorian and uh, Boba Fett, come on. Anybody in the room? 
Yeah, there you go. Okay. So the Mandalorian, uh, I love the Star Trek, Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars stuff is just uh, amazing, you know, television in my mind. It's just should be nominated in every category for the Oscars. Um, but anyway, The Mandalorian is kind of a cool show. And uh, the idea behind The Mandalorian is he's part of this religious order. Believe it or not, he's part of this religious order that basically says that they are supposed to follow the way of the Mandalore, also known as the way of the Mandalore. Um, it was a religion followed by Orthodox Mandalorians. So there's, there's all of these religions and different perspectives and uh, different ideas going on in the whole Star Wars universe, which is kind of cool. The thing about Mandalorians is, is that, and this is kind of weird, The faith is practiced by this society, and basically they have a code of behavior and traditions that are honored in their heritage. Basically, they're supposed to protect fellow Mandalorians. Okay, I get that. They have to wear a helmet at all times. Just think about that for a moment. You have to wear a helmet at all times, even with the people that you love. So now you're in a marriage relationship and you're a Mandalorian, right? That's kind of weird. Um, The way stated that if a Mandalorian removed their helmet in front of another living being, they were no longer permitted to wear nor be considered a Mandalorian anymore. And they were considered an apostate. And the only way for them to not become an apostate anymore was to bathe in the waters of the living water beneath the mines of Mandalore. You came to church wanting to know that, didn't you? (laughs) Today. Yeah. I tell you that because there are a lot of things about religion, especially the Christian religion, that we don't know about. We, we take some things for granted. We make up our own ideas, or they make up their ideas about what they think Christians believe. And to be quite frank, if we're not careful, we will tell ourselves stories about what we think we believe. Because we haven't taken the time to think through some of the possibilities or actually what the scripture teaches And so today, I want to take you through the process of understanding this very, very difficult text where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's very rare in our culture to have examples where um, there are things that are exclusive in religion, and Christianity is one of them. And it doesn't go over well with our friends, right? It doesn't go over well that we're exclusive and that there are some outsiders and we're ostracizing people, or at least that's the story that gets told. In our culture today, we are most often confronted with the desire to seek fairness. Think about this from your friends, right? Uh, When they start to set standards for what's right and wrong in their world, they start with the standard of what's fair for everybody rather than what's right and wrong. Because if it's not fair, then it can't be right. If we treat one person differently than another person, that's not fair. We can't have a world where we treat people differently. Fairness becomes the standard by which morality starts to be formed in our culture. There's an emphasis over fairness, fairness over rightness. And it seems to uh, be the determining factor in a lot of our conversations with our friends who don't go to church and who have made up a story in their mind about what this Christian life, this exclusionary Christian life is like. Maybe we've even told ourselves some things about what it is. So many people seem to be defining their ethical decisions by what seems fair instead of on what the Bible would call a moral standard by what God has to say. There's a young barista who is in his store, and he tells the story about how crazy upside down the ethics of our culture have been shifting, right? We knew some things were right and wrong, but now things are shifting, and we're not sure anymore whether things are right and wrong anymore. So we say, he told this story that there's a guy who comes in pretty regularly to the coffee shop, and he says he always buys the cheapest thing on the menu, a small black cup of coffee. Then he goes over to the sugar and cream station, but before he goes, he says, I'd like an extra large cup, please, small black coffee and an empty cup. Now he goes over to the sugar and cream station, he walks over there and begins to fix his black coffee, and then fills up the extra large cup with with 2% milk. 
and then leaves the store. Now, the guy behind the counter, the barista says, that's just not right. <laughs> that's just crazy. He's walking out of the, stealing from the store. So they made him a shift manager, and he decides to take responsibility for the situation. Every day, this man comes in. Now he's a shift manager. And he says to the man, he says, well, if you're going to ask me for an extra cup, I'm going to charge you for 2% milk. Well, the man freaked out. And you know what happens when Kevins and Karens freak out? They ask for the manager, right? They ask for the manager and complains to the manager about the fact that this barista was going to make him pay for this extra milk. And the guy turns to the person he's telling the story to. He says, you'll never guess what happened. He says, instead of this man having to pay for the 2% milk, I got written up for not giving him the best customer experience in the store. He says, how crazy and mixed up is the world that we live in? Because fairness or object standards of right and wrong begin to dissipate in our culture. And then Jesus comes along and says, no, no, I'm sorry. There is a very specific way and there is a very specific truth that I need you to understand. And when you understand that way and the truth, now you will have life. And far too many people have told themselves stories about what that means. And I want to share with you what I believe it means. Let's talk to, um, let's go, we're going to read from John chapter 14 in just a minute. There are, there are times in our culture when we have to stand up for the truth of the message of the gospel, and yet there is something about the culture that has shifted that is going to help inform us about a new way of seeing God in our midst. So you might actually be hearing me say, there's something good about the culture that we're in now, but there's also something good about the Bible and what it has to say that it comes together. And so now I'm gonna try and pull these two things together, that there is this, uh, this desire that everyone be treated fairly, that there is uh, a way for all people to get to know God, that there is a way for everyone to get to know the Heavenly Father. But we also have this teaching from Jesus, and he says, I'm the only way. How do we bring these two things together? Because I think that they can be brought together. But let's first take a look at John chapter 14. Uh, the disciples are finally getting the picture that Jesus is telling them that he's going to leave. In the end of chapter 13, this is 14 verse 1. At the end of chapter 13, Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. And this is the beginning of that journey to the cross. And Jesus says, die for me. I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. So here becomes that journey. And Jesus says, I'm leaving. Peter says, I want to come. Jesus says, look, tomorrow morning, you're just going to say to somebody three times that you don't even know who I am. All right. Now then we get to chapter 14. But, says Jesus... Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know that the way to where I'm going. <laughs> now Thomas pipes up. No, Lord, we don't know. We don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And here's that phrase. And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now, many of you memorize that verse. I can see a whole bunch of you just saying the words with me because it's such an important verse. But the people in our culture, the people in our world, find that disturbingly offensive. And if you're in high school or you're in college or university, you've probably heard this, that us Christians are, are bigoted and we are exclusionary and, and we uh, think that we're better than everybody else or whatever the narrative is. And they will probably come to this passage and say, see, this is what Jesus said. 
And I want to talk for a minute about what he meant here. He proclaims that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we don't under, didn't even understand that, then he goes on to say, and no one will come to the Father except through me. So let's talk about that first phrase, I am the way. I am the way. And the word way, basically, you know, if you say, well, this is the way that we're supposed to go, or you need to go that way, or when you say that, you're describing a starting point and an ending point, but you're not talking about the starting point, you're not talking about the ending point, you're talking about the space in between, right? That's the way to get there. You start here, this is the way, and you get there. Jesus says, I am the way. And he makes it very clear that he is the only way. So we can't say with some others who claim to be Christians that there are many ways to God. We cannot say that. We cannot say that if you follow Buddha or Hindu, that you can get to the Father. Jesus makes this claim. I didn't make it. You didn't make it. This is Jesus' words. That sounds pretty exclusionary, doesn't it? We cannot escape the fact that Jesus is the gate through which we enter the way. Our belief in him is the door that opens to the way to the Father. That journey is between now and the time we get to heaven and for all eternity after that. It's the way of reconciliation. It's the journey that we go through where our sins are forgiven from all the past. Just think of the guilt that you feel from all of the things that you've done to those in your life. The guilt that you feel for the way in which you've treated your parents or your children. The guilt that you feel that things didn't turn out the way they were supposed to. The way of Jesus is forgiveness of the guilt of all my sin. But the way of Jesus is also the forgiveness of all of the sins yet to come and the power over sin. Jesus says, I am the way. I'm going to walk with you like I am in the fire. Remember that song that I just talked about this morning? I think that's why it's so stuck in my brain when I needed to tell this to you. Because there's another in the fire. We are walking the journey with Jesus. He's not going to let you escape the fire necessarily. Oftentimes he does this help us escape the fire. But he's there with us <coughs> to overcome the power of sin. Without Jesus giving us the way to the Father through his sacrifice, through his payment of our sin, we wouldn't even be able to find the way. Okay, what about the truth? Well, that's illumination. If the way is reconciliation, I'm reconciled, I'm made right before God, my sins are forgiven, I have the power to overcome sin in my life, then the truth is illumination. Something is revealed when I know the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. What does that mean, that he is the truth? Well, I think that he's trying to communicate to us, once again, of the personal nature of who he is. Like, this is God who came to earth. He became one of us. He wasn't completely human. Well, he was completely human. And he was completely God at the same time. But he came to earth to show us that we can have a relationship with him. That there's this personal relationship that he can communicate to us his wants and desires and I can communicate to him my wants and desires. And it's through Jesus that we get to know what the Heavenly Father's like. He is holy. That's what it means, the truth. I am the way, the truth. If the truth is to be illuminated, the first part is, is that he's personal. He's relatable. He's someone who I can talk to, but he's also holy. He's not like me in that sense where I'm not holy. You know, we see good and evil in the world, and we see order and disorder, but there's nothing in this world that is completely good or completely evil. Even in the most evil people in the world, there is still some good. And even in the most good people in the world, there is still some evil. God is completely holy. I am the truth, he says. 
I am the truth of what? That he is completely and absolutely holy. It's the only way that it's possible for him to forgive sin. When he is sacrificed, that is now possible, that our sins are forgiven. And thirdly, that God is a God of mercy. When I say the truth, it's about him being personal, it's about him being holy, but also he's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. It's not about a robotic relationship where you must, you have to. If you don't, here's the judgment. God is like, no, no, wait a second. I don't want to have that kind of relationship with you. I want to have a friendship, a love relationship, where I get to show you how I feel about who you are. And you, in turn, show me how you feel about who I am. And God is not deaf to the cries of humanity. He hears us. And he wants us to receive justice and to, uh, to, he wants to provide for us peace and joy and goodness and self-control and all the blessings of the Christian life. But then there's the third part. I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And that's regeneration. If the first part is reconciliation, the second part is illumination, then this part is about regeneration. I am the life. To be regenerated, to be reborn, to be renewed, to be regenerated, to be plugged into the power source so that the battery in my life is charged. (laughs) To be renewed, the regeneration that comes. He says, I am the life. Christ can make you alive. His promises can give you all that you need in this life and the life to come. Eternal life. So that sounds like a pretty narrow gate, doesn't it? It sounds as though there's this one way. Uh, Jesus is standing in the gate. You can't slip past him. You can't get around him. You can't climb the gate. He's like, I'm the way. You've got to come through me. Because I'm going to give you the truth about who you are, about how sinful you are. But I'm also going to give you life because I love you unconditionally. And then in the text, it goes on in verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. These disciples, they, 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 they needed more. They were like Jesus saying, I'm leaving, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be with my father. Peter says, I want to go with you. Jesus says, you're not ready. Thomas says, I don't know where you're going. And Jesus gives him this philosophical answer rather than a, a directional answer. Well, I'm going this way and you can follow. No, no, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the father except through me. And now Peter, or sorry, Philip says, Lord, show us the father and we'll be satisfied. And then Jesus says this, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does this, his work through me? Just believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least... Believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. That is just such an outlandish statement. You, sitting here, can do greater works than Jesus did. That's what he's saying. What works are we talking about here? Certainly, they, the disciples would have understood the miracles that Jesus did, right? Jesus did all kinds of miracles, and we know today that God still does miracles. Now, let me ask you this. Those of you who are parents, look at me. Your child has just now been diagnosed with a terminal illness, and there is no hope for recovery. If you were to pray, what would be greater for you to pray for? That they get to know Jesus or that they get healed? 
when you think about it as a parent, what would be the best thing for me to pray for in this moment if my child had a terminal illness? Well, certainly I'd pray for both, right? But there, what would be the priority in this? Wouldn't it be that that child knows Jesus? That if it's their time and that this is their life and that life is now coming to an end even though they're young and small and still impressionable and there's no hope for them in this world, wouldn't you pray for hope in the next world for them? Jesus said you will do even greater things than what I've shown you. Whenever you, as a follower of Jesus, who have embraced the way, the truth, and the life, and pray for someone, and share with someone the joy of knowing who Jesus is, the fact that you've been adopted into his family, and that the the responsibilities and the, the, the actions that I take are so small compared to all that I have been given and been blessed with, wouldn't it be best to pray that they get to know the Lord himself? You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it, says Jesus. So back to this idea about the stories we tell. What do I do with this friend of mine who says, you know what, I think there's many ways to get to God. Well, what about the Muslims in this world? What about all of the Jews? What about all the Hindus in this world? Is there no hope for them? Ooh, that starts to get a little nerve-wracking. You've got to have this conversation with someone. Or maybe you're even wrestling with that. I think that we've got to start searching the scriptures because if we go by this one verse alone, we can create a story about what Jesus meant without taking in the full context of the scripture. I've been telling some of you through those Bible studies that we've been writing, that I was writing and and we've been sharing, and Elaine was just, I'm like, you're just awesome. You're learning everything I've been teaching you, which is great. (laughs) What is the context? What is Jesus really doing? I want you to think about the fact that Jesus loved the other, the person outside this group of people, the person who lives in a world where fairness rules, where they don't believe that there is only one way. Jesus said, I love the other. Just think about the stories that he told and the the things that he teached about, taught about, and spoke about. One of the parables was that this wealthy man throws open the doors of the banquet house when the elites say they are too busy and says, anyone, everyone is welcome to the table of the Lord. Everyone is welcome. Anyone is welcome. And then Jesus tells the story about the, the, the shepherd who has one lost sheep and he goes to find them. He leaves the 99 behind. He walks out of the church where all the Jesus people are and says, I need to find that person who's lost. What about the prodigal son story where the father says he was dead, but now he's alive. I've been waiting for him to come to show himself to come back. Jesus loves the other, the person outside the church, a person who says, I don't need you. I don't believe you. And yet Jesus does. He loves. The Apostle Paul talked about this. You know, there's this story, crazy story in the New Testament about how there's this guy in a church, so imagine, in a church, he's sleeping with his stepmother. <laughs> and the church is like, yeah, we're okay with this. <laughs> and Paul says, uh-uh, wait a minute. I've spoken to you about sexual sin before, and this guy is totally not being holy and pure, let alone the fact that you all agree that it's okay, and he thinks it's okay, and you're just letting it all go. Paul says, I command you to toss that guy out of the church. Ooh, you think he's harsh. No, no. He stepped in and agreed to this. He stood at the gate. 
and looked at Jesus in the face and said, I believe you. And I'm going to live my life according to the standards that you set out. Only then can we hold someone accountable. And then Paul says this, which is so powerful. Verse 9 in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulged in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I mean, that you are, I mean that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But we are not to judge people outside. We are not to hold them to the standards of those inside the church. If we did that, we couldn't live in this world. We would have to be taken out. See, I believe in the Christian faith that there is room for tolerance for people who believe certain things that are outside of the faith. I cannot hold them accountable to the standard if they have not entered into the gate. If they have not stepped through the gate on the way to truth and life. Now, I can uh, push back against the world and some of the teachings of the world because it makes psychological sense. It makes moral sense, the, the way that God describes things. But I am not to judge them spiritually or even emotionally if they're outside of the church. Do we have room in our heart and in our soul for people who don't believe like us? You see, our creator wasn't content to, to reject people outside the church. He went out to find them. He said, my love for you is audacious. It is extravagant. And I'm asking you to choose to come in. It's like being adopted into a family. If you were to be adopted into a family, you would know, at least hopefully, a good adoption, in a good adoption, you, as if you were an older child or even if you were a young teenager and you were adopted in the family, you would say, you know what, I, I trust that this family is going to care for me and love me and provide for me, that their, that their rules and, and their name and the way that they live life is going to become my way of life. I choose them and they choose me. God says, I want you to be part of the family. I stand here at the gate. It's open for anyone who wants to come in. Anyone. No matter the sin that brought you here, no matter the belief system that you brought here, it is open for anyone. But if you step through this gate, you commit to being part of this family. And once you commit to being part of the family, we now then love one another. If you become part of an adoption story and you've got brothers and sisters who are biological or even other adopted brothers and sisters, that means that you've got to love those people. You may not like them at first, <laughs> but you're supposed to love them. Author Keith Miller tells the story about a 40-year-old woman who was adopted. She said, when I was a tiny little girl, my parents died, and I was put in an orphanage. It was not pretty at all, and no one seemed to want me. Just think about the emotions of this, right? She's old enough to feel these things. But I longed to be adopted. I was not pretty at all, and no one seemed to want me. 
I wanted to be loved by a family as far back as I can remember. And I thought about it day and night, but everything I did seemed to go wrong. I must have tried too hard to please the people who came to look me over. And what I did was to drive them away. Can you imagine a child thinking those thoughts? That that's their problem? But then one day, the head of the orphanage told me that my family was coming to take me home with them. A family was coming to take me home with them. I was so excited that I jumped up and down and I cried like a little baby. And the matron reminded me that I was on trial. And this might not be a permanent arrangement, but I just knew that somehow it would work out. So I went with this family and I started school. I was the happiest little girl you could imagine, and life began to open up for me just a little. But then one day I went home to the front door of the big old house we lived in, and no one was home. In the middle of the front hall was my battered suitcase and my little coat thrown across it. And as I stood there, I suddenly dawned on me what it meant that I didn't belong there anymore. Now, the, Miller, the writer, Miller, he said, when the woman stopped speaking, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. But then she cleared her throat and she said, matter-of-factly, this happened to me seven times before I was 13. But wait, she says, don't feel too badly for me. It was experiences like this that ultimately brought me to God. And there I found that I had an always found what I had always longed for, a place, a sense of belonging, a forever family. You see, God is not going to put you on trial when he opens that gate to you, when he says, do you believe that this is what I have done for you, to forgive you your sins, that I am the one that you put your trust in, and you open that gate and come in? There's no trial, period. There's no, if you do it right, then you can stay, but if you do it wrong, you're out. Once you're in, you're in. And when Jesus says you're part of my family, he promises to love you unconditionally, to hold you in the palm of his hand, to walk with you through the storms, through the fire in your life. He says, I went out to look for you, and I found you in this terrible mess that you were in. And I love you. And I want you to be part of my family. That's the adoption story that we want to hear about. That's the adoption story that we all want to be part of. And it's not a story of excluding people. It's a story of God's openness and love. But he says it all is up to you. You choose. Once you're in, you're in. But you've got to choose. So when your friend tells you that Christianity is just legalistic or it's too exclusionary or, you know, you people, Christians, I want you to tell them your adoption story about how God loved you the way you are. And he let me in the way I am. And that he loves me the way I am. And I choose to follow him. Amen. Maybe someone here this morning needs to say yes to Jesus. So Lord, I I need to be adopted in your family. And if that's you this morning, I want you to join me as we pray together. Lord, I thank you that you are a loving heavenly father with open arms that you want us, that you love us, and that you want us to be part of the family. If that's you this morning and you want to do that, all you need to do is to say, yes, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are the one who saves me from my sin and that you love me unconditionally. And I want to be part of your family. And for the rest of us, Lord, help us not to tell stories about what is going to confuse people about this idea of being part of the family of God. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. 
Help us to bring this message to as many as possible that they might be part of this family. In Jesus' name, amen.